So thank you for being here to listen to me talk about shame, which sort of seems like an anachronistic topic, but I think it actually fits very well into this conference theme because shame is such an important reinforcer of our values, uh, old values and of course new values. When we're forming new values, shame plays this invaluable role in that. And then also with the digital age, shame is taking on some very new properties. And I think with those new properties comes perhaps some new rules that shame is going to abide by. So I want to talk a little bit about shame in general and then shame in the digital era. And I got really interested in shame because I uh, originally studied global issues like climate change and overfishing and fisheries uh, and fish in general. And this study got me very interested in the topic of shame because that little fish in the mouth is, is cleaning parasites off of the bigger client fish. And this is an act of cooperation between species, which is pretty neat. And they have an incentive to cheat because if they take more than the parasite, they get a, you know, an extra snack. But if that client fish loses too much of its flesh during the deal, it'll, it'll stop working with that cleaner fish, right? So sometimes they cheat and sometimes they don't, but they really don't cheat when another client fish is watching them clean. They're basically looking for the reputation of that cleaner. And so when that cleaner is being watched, it behaves differently. And of course, uh, homo sapiens also behave differently when being watched. And this is demonstrated time and time again, but experimentally, a paper came out in 2006 by some psychologists showing that if they just alternated above a, a box that you pay money in for tea in a UK, uh, tea room, and it's an honesty box, you can pay or not, I mean, if you're dishonest, you could skip. And they alternated flowers one week and eyes the next week. Flowers one week, eyes the next week, over the course of these 10 weeks. And what they found was that when humans, homo sapiens, were, felt the cues of being watched, they wound up paying three times more uh, than when they weren't being watched, with that just fake eyes posted above the box. So this idea of just simply being watched is intimately linked to, to shame. And so it's no surprise that we have a lot of sort of public policies to try to uh, enhance that system, that feeling of being watched, things like CCTV and surveillance cameras. And then there are other things like uh, hygiene cards that they've introduced in Los Angeles and now in New York City that show the restaurant hygiene to the customer as you walk in the door. So you can either have an A, B, or a C grade. And these are really interesting uh, transparency systems because they say, look, we want the customers to know how clean it is in here. And if it's cleaner, maybe you'll reward the, the restaurant with more business. And in fact, this has been very successful as well in reducing uh, public illnesses due to foodborne pathogens. And so uh, that data, that behavior is available the minute you walk into the restaurant, you have a signal. But sometimes the data is not so available. Um, it's there and we have these major databases, but it's more remote from the decision. So this, for instance, is a, uh, is a database on all the fishery subsidies in Europe. And so you can go on here and look at which countries are the highest amount of fishery subsidies, i.e. public money going to support uh, fisheries on the oceans, very uh, opposite of sort of a free market approach. Um, but this kind of data is often, again, separate from the moment in which you might need it. And uh, it also isn't necessarily uh, salient. Maybe we don't care about all this data. Maybe we really only care about some of it. And in fact, like a lot of major global problems, like climate change, we do only worry about certain players in the game. And as I flew into Munich just before coming here, I was very impressed with all the solar panels I saw and thinking about how people here must really want to shame China and the US into actually doing something. So, one thing that I've done is run cooperative experiments uh, that sort of mimic the climate change game. 
and I play them with groups of six students. And at the end of those games, I ask, out of these six people, which are all anonymous and they don't know who's making what decision, if you could know the identity of one of the players, who would you want to know? And this was simply to demonstrate to my colleagues who said, you know, we have to have the data to back it up, uh, that, and this is the, the data here, that overwhelmingly, first choice, people want to know the least generous player. They want to know who's ruining it for the rest of us. And this is where shame comes in, obviously. And the, the next thing we've done is we've run uh, cooperation experiments with groups of six students, again, uh, in, with undergraduates in the lab. And all six of those students came from the same class. So we knew they would meet again later in the, in the term. And they each played in one of three different treatments. So they either played in shame, honor, or a control experiment where everyone remained anonymous. And in the shame experiment, we said, at the end of 10 rounds of playing this game, we're going to expose the two least generous players. And in the honor, obviously, it was just the inverse. We'll expose the two most generous players. This is just our, our lab setup. And uh, they also had to come up in a very sort of I don't know, medieval fashion, and write their name on the board in front of everyone. And these are our results. We see that both shame and, interestingly, honor increase cooperation by about 50%. So we know that shame, um, we can see it empirically as well, but we can see it experimentally that it increases cooperation, that it will change behavior, the threat of shame will, will change how we act. Now, does that mean it's a good thing? Not necessarily. That's where values come in. And I think we would all agree that we don't want to go back to living in this era of the scarlet, the scarlet letter. And uh, this has a very physical element of shame. She has to wear the A on her chest. But the thing I worry about or I'm interested in watching is how shame is evolving in the digital era. And while we might not agree with this particular brand of shame, I have a feeling that we might see this kind of tweet uh, if Hawthorne was an author today, um, that Hester Prynne was an adulteress and, and telling his social network. Or maybe, if he was really cool, he might have posted her um, photo and name on cheaterville.com, where uh, I like, look who's getting caught with their pants down. You can look up people that you're potentially interested in dating and see if anyone's reported them as cheaters in the past. So this is a really uh, modern form, I think, of the Scarlet Letter. And so this might also seem very uncomfortable to us. Uh, but what about this? This is a Craigslist in New York City in Manhattan. And last year, they introduced uh, a link up in the top right-hand corner to New York City's worst landlords. And this links to a public information system. Oops. Uh, it, well, it, I guess I deleted the slide. It links to a public information system where you can look at every, uh, well, the top 500 worst landlords in New York City and see where they're located, how many infractions they have, and why they have those infractions. So it protects you as a renter from renting from bad landlords. I think some of us in this room might be more comfortable th with that than, for instance, cheaterville.com. And the question is why? What makes these different? What makes shame okay in one scenario and not another? And so I also wanted to get a sense for people's intuitions about shaming, about the act of exposure. And uh, unfortunately, I've only tested people in the United States so far, but we gave them 16 different shaming scenarios. And we basically asked who, we changed different variables in every scenario, but the four main things we were looking at, four categories, were who imposes the shame, whether or not it was the state, or the crowd, you know, is it the government coming in or is it crowdsourced on Twitter or something like that? Whether the shame is physical, are you wearing a sign like Hester Prynne or is your, it your name published online on a, on a website? Uh, whether the individual or whether the offender, the shamed entity was an individual or whether it was a group of people, a corporation, or whether the crime was private or public. 
So we surveyed 111 people via Amazon Mechanical Turk. If you've heard of it, it's a great web-based opportunity to basically employ people. Um, and we got 65 females out of those 111, and the, our mean age was around 30. Oh, there's the other side. Okay, so here's an example question. Over the course of a year, John Smith stole more than a million dollars from one of his clients, an elderly man who had been a client since his retirement. As part of the sentencing, a judge required Smith to put a sign outside his firm that described his crime. So it's, a, it's shaming an individual. It's, uh, the victim is a private, uh, a, a private person and not a public, you know, a, t a taxpayer, for instance. Yeah. Um, the state is doing the shaming, a judge, and the shaming is physical. And we expected people to have a very different reaction to something like this than um, this example, where over the course of a year, Sparrow Corporation committed income tax fraud, cheated the community out of more than a million dollars. People who were upset by the crime, the crowd, published Sparrow's name online in a series of articles about delinquent taxpayers. So you can see these are sort of the two extremes of that spectrum of 16 questions. And just to give you an overview of sort of, oh, so this is, this is uh, to demonstrate. On the one hand, a judge in the United States actually issued this punishment for this woman to ho hold up a sign saying that she stole from a nine-year-old on her birthday. And uh, don't steal or this could happen to you. So this is a classic type of shaming punishment in the US. And we thought that people might feel very differently about that than publishing names online in the state of California, for instance, for not paying your taxes, which is something that affects the entire group, not just one nine-year-old girl. And in fact, the state of California has been publishing the top uh, 250 tax delinquents in the state since 2007. They've gotten $81 million in taxes as a result of threatening that to um, people who won't pay. And they have basically shown that this form of shaming really pays off. The question still is, do we think it's right? So we also, we, when we gave people those scenarios, we asked them three questions. How ashamed will people feel? How effective would this be? And how acceptable is it? And overall, people found that the, the subjects being shamed, the corporations and the individuals, they were only somewhat likely to feel ashamed. They didn't think that they were uh, very susceptible. They did think that individuals were much more likely to feel shame than corporations. That's not surprising because we attribute uh, emotions to individuals more than we do companies. Um, they were also unsure whether or not shaming would really deter others from committing that same crime. So we're seeing again this sort of ambivalence about shame. But where things got interesting was that uh, subjects found the punishments more than somewhat acceptable. Uh, in other words, people's intuitions about the shaming that we discussed were fairly positive. They were welcoming shame in these contexts. And to look, parse out into those uh, finer categories, people found uh, physical shaming far less acceptable, significantly less uh, acceptable than online shaming. So this is where things get interesting to me. People are more accepting of the idea of your name being published online than they are a sign being posted in your yard. Uh, so why, why do we have that disconnect between a digital reputation and a physical reputation? And also that um, state shaming was more acceptable than crowd shaming. This sort of surprised me because I thought that people would, especially Americans, would be in favor of sort of that vigilante uh, shame, but in fact, the source matters so much in these things that uh, it seems to be that people trust the state more than the, the crowd when it comes to shaming. Um, on the other hand, people didn't see any difference between shaming an individual or a corporation, which surprised me. And also, they didn't mind if the crime was private or public. They sort of found them um, equally acceptable. So there are major findings, again, we're in, the, we're in the previous categories. So as we move forward, uh, the questions that I'm asking myself and that I'm writing about currently are, what are the optimal characteristics of shame? For instance, 
Um, what if it involved a photograph of you online? Would that change things? Does somehow that physical element differ greatly from your name? How many or what percentage of the population should we expose? In our experiments, we exposed a third of the players, two out of the six in a group. Uh, that's actually a lot of exposure. Uh, what is that optimal level? Um, how frequently can you really employ shame and it have any meaning? Uh, what are the long-term effects of shaming? In our experiments, for instance, the people who were shamed then gave less money after that exposure. In other words, once they had a bad reputation, they lived up to it. And the people who received the honor, they actually continued to donate and donated more than their, than their group mates. Because again, it, people have a, earned a reputation and now they seem to act by it. Uh, do these variables change across cultures? For instance, even people's intuitions about shaming might be very different here in Germany. I'm sure, I'm sure the, I, I imagine that in many respects, you would, your culture would answer differently to some of these questions than the American culture. And in fact, I tried to run some experimental data in Britain, and for instance, they do see a public crime as more offensive than a, a private crime. Um, is shaming proportional? The, the legal scholars are really interested in this question. Because of the digital era, you know, if you're caught on film, putting a cat in a garbage bin, as happened in Britain, and this woman was shamed, 20,000 people hated her on Facebook, um, and the judge actually gave her a lighter sentence in the end because of all the public shame that she faced, she actually had a, a much stronger punishment in some sense than people who committed worse crimes and weren't caught on film. And this issue of, of exposing people in the digital information age I think really does call into the question the issue of proportionality with punishment. And also, can shaming shift our values one way or another? And if so, in which direction? Because right now, um, if you expose 250 people that don't pay their taxes, maybe people realize, oh, I didn't even know that was an option. Maybe I shouldn't pay my taxes either. In other words, you're almost exposing that this behavior is um, normal. On the other hand, it might reinforce values, and that's been Shane's traditional role in our society. So these are the questions I'm asking, and I hope I can answer within a year or so. Thank you.